Sufism, or Tasawwuf, has become famous around the world for its various artistic expressions. Art, music, and perhaps most of all, poetry. The Persian Sufi Jalal ad-Din Rumi is immensely popular in many parts of Europe and North America today, and was for a while the best-selling poet in the US. Other Persian poets have also been referenced numerous times in pop culture, such as Hafiz, Saadi, and Attar, just to mention a few. However, for some reason, Arabic Sufi poetry has not received the same amount of love, even though it is equally as important and significant for the history of Sufism and Sufi poetry. The Persian poets deserve all the love that they get, of course, but it's still worthwhile to explore the incredibly beautiful and vast tradition of Arabic Sufi poetry, which include many significant figures like Ibn Arabi, Ibn al-Farid, and one of my Personal favorites, Abu Hassan Ashushtari. Abu al-Hassan al-Shushtari is one of the most significant and most renowned mystical poets in the Arabic language, and his poems and songs are still sung in Sufi gatherings across North Africa. His literary output is vast and very influential, and he has even sometimes been referred to as the Rumi of the West. Despite this, not a lot of people around the world know about him, certainly not as much as they know about someone like Rumi, for example, and not a lot of academic study has been dedicated to him or his works. Hopefully this is about to change, and I hope this episode will contribute to more knowledge about this fascinating figure. Ashtushtari was born in the year 1212 in Spain, and in particular in a small village near Granada called Shushtar, where he gets his nisbah or name from. We are thus dealing with another 13th century figure, that period which brought some of the most significant philosophers and mystics in history. Maybe he would have been better known had he not had to compete with so many other great figures of his day. Reports say that he came from a rather well-off aristocratic family, perhaps connected to the ruling elite. But at some point in his adult life, as he was working as a traveling merchant, he instead turned to the Sufi way, an ascetic life on the mystical path. This is a common trope among many similar figures, but it's quite possibly true. The chronicler Ibn al-Khatib writes about Shushtari that, quote, He came from a line of emirs and joined the ranks of the poor. Indeed, Shushtari became a kind of wandering Sufi, and he traveled around Al-Andalus and the Maghrib, which is western North Africa. It seems that he became particularly connected with the Tariqa, or Sufi order, of the famous 12th century mystic Abu Madian through his followers in Tunisia and Algeria, and that Shushtari's path in particular was one of relatively extreme asceticism and poverty. Throughout his life and in his writings, he would always put an emphasis on the concept of tajrid, of stripping bare, literally, or stripping oneself of all attachment to worldly things, identities, and to the self or ego. Indeed, later in his life, when he was a respected Sufi master, he would be referred to as the Imam al-Mutajaridin, leader of the withdrawn Sufis, literally those who strip away. He renounced most worldly things and became famous, among other things, for wearing the, the patch cloak of, of Sufi poverty, as well as serving and, and giving to the poor, which is a theme that we will return to later on. He was a well-learned and educated man, though, as we can clearly see in his writings. He learned all the religious sciences growing up, he knew the Quran, the Hadith, and Islamic law, of which he was a kind of expert, actually. At one point, he was even offered the position of chief judge in Libya in the city of Tripoli, but turned it down in a very dramatic fashion by shaving off his beard and eyebrows, leading to accusations of madness. This very strong reluctance of Shushtari to have any association with worldly power and its jurists is another theme that will come back later in the discussion. But it is in 1248, when he would have been around 35 years old, that his life and legacy would be significantly altered as he encountered the very charismatic and controversial mystic philosopher Ibn Sabain. This initial meeting took place in Bouji in modern Algeria, where Ibn Sabain is thought to have uttered the completely amazing words, quote, 
If it is paradise you desire, go with Sheikh Abu Madian, which was the founder of the tariqah that Shushtari was following at the time. If it is the master of paradise that you desire, then let's begin. Which is, I'll say it again, just a completely badass thing to say. And naturally, of course, Shushtari from that moment on became a devoted disciple of Ibn Sabain for the rest of his life. Ibn Sabain is an incredibly fascinating figure, and he is also controversial for his seemingly monistic, almost non-dual mystical philosophy and interpretation of, of Islam and, and the world. And that is also because of his connection to Ibn Sabain that Shushtari was also eventually somewhat of a controversial figure, at least in certain circles. The 14th century Hanbali theologian Ibn Taymiyyah very famously wrote attacks against certain figures, primarily Sufis, whose ideas he considered to be unacceptable. Ibn Arabi was included in this attack, whose doctrine of Wahdat al-Wujud was deemed heretical. In the same breath, though, Ibn Taymiyyah also turns to Ibn Sabain and his followers, which included Ash-Shushtari, and deems them to be even worse than Ibn Arabi. They are the worst of the worst, in other words. Ibn Khaldun in the Muqaddimah makes a similar division where the school of Ibn Arabi, while still being suspect and dangerous, are at least not as extreme as the followers of Ibn Sabain. This is mostly due to the characteristic mystical philosophy that they adhere to, one that was often referred to as Wahdat al-Mutlaqa, absolute unity or absolute oneness. This probably reminds you of the famous Wahdat al-Wujud, the unity of being ascribed to Ibn Arabi and his followers, and the two ideas are similar in many ways. Reality is ultimately one, and there is nothing in existence but God, who is the real, al-Haq itself. However, Ibn Sabain and his followers were a bit more radical in their expression of this idea and the conclusions that they drew from it. Whereas Ibn Arabi viewed the world as relatively real, the world is the reflection and manifestation of God's infinite attributes, and he always maintains a certain difference between the two, and that is God and creation in a certain sense, Ibn Sabain and his school saw the world as a complete illusion. There is only God, nothing else. Ibn Sabain would famously exclaim, Allahu faqat, God only or God alone. And Ash-Shushtari mirrors this in his writings by saying, Allahu faqat wa laysa illa, God alone and nothing else. In a characteristic section, Ibn Sabain writes, quote, I was first led to say, I have never seen a thing without seeing God behind it. Then to say, which is closer to the truth, I have never seen a thing without seeing God with it. Then finally to say, I have never seen a thing without seeing God before it. Now, I can only say, he, he, he. This may seem radical, and it kind of is in some ways. Um, even someone like Ibn Arabi would rarely express his ideas about oneness in such direct and radical ways. But being a student of Ibn Sabain, Ashushtari also expresses himself in his poems and his writings in similarly uh, strong and, and, and maybe even radical ways. Now, to understand the doctrines of these figures and their relationship to the larger Islamic intellectual world and tradition, we need, of course, to consider their environment. Ashushtari came from the Islamic West, from Al-Andalus, which is modern Spain. This Western world, including the Maghreb and the Islamic East, had developed somewhat distinct mystical traditions even though they were in contact, of course. By the 12th and 13th centuries, Sufism, quote-unquote, had entered the Western world, and people like Shushtari and Ibn Sabain can rightly be called Sufis, in a sense. But we should also understand that they are inheritors to a unique mystical tradition that developed in the West, in particular. Nowadays, we tend to use the word Sufism to refer to all this, right? Any form of Islamic mysticism is Sufism. But in the earlier periods, Sufism, or Tasawwuf, was primarily associated with the mystical developments that took place in the central Islamic lands, such as in Baghdad. They were concerned with the psychological development of the soul on the journey towards intimacy with God through direct mystical knowledge of him, called Ma'arifah. Now again, this stuff was present in the West as well, but we also see a unique form of quote-unquote mysticism developing here, usually traced back to the fascinating 10th century mystic philosopher Ibn Masarra. 
he and his followers were more speculatively inclined, influenced by Neoplatonic ideas and developed complex cosmological and metaphysical systems into which mystical practice played. In particular, these mystics were concerned with a concept called ettebar, meaning contemplation, as well as something called ibra, of crossing over, literally, from this mundane realm to the other divine realm through contemplation of the science in nature, the Qur'an of nature which was the manifestation of the divine attributes. By the 12th century, these ideas were further represented and developed by figures like Ibn Barajan and Ibn al-Arif, who in turn would have a major influence on the great mystics of the 13th century. In a way, you could say that the great Western Sufi mystics of the 13th century, such as Ibn Arabi, Ibn Sabain, Afif ad-Din Tilimsani, and Ashushtari, kind of represent the culmination of that culture. They take both the ideas and practices of Eastern Sufism and marry it with the native speculative mystical traditions, as well as other philosophical movements, to create truly fascinating and influential ideas. One central idea that is quite unique to this particular group of mystics is an emphasis on the concept of tahqiq, of realization or verification. Indeed, to further complicate our categories, when we read people like Ibn Arabi or Shushtari, we find them dividing people into groups like Sufis, Gnostics, Arifun, the people of blame, or the Malamatiya, and Muhaqqiqun, people of verification, or verifiers, or realizers, maybe. All these being different categories of mystics, even though the categories often overlap, of course. And to Ashushtari, the Muhaqqiqun, the people of Taqiq, or verification, are the top of the ladder. It is this group that he sees himself as belonging to. Now, again, we shouldn't take these categories too seriously, as we can still call Shushtari a Sufi, and he would probably himself have recognized himself as part of the tradition of Tasawwuf, but we should rather see it as different stages, or levels, or maybe approaches to reaching God. The idea of tahqiq seems to have been developed from the earlier Western idea of ittibar, or of contemplation and ibra crossing over, but developed into a rather new concept of the utmost experience or realization of the oneness of God, a true realization of the fact that there is only God. God is all, and all else is illusion. Ashushtari is mostly famous for his poetry, which we will return to, and we find this monistic or non-dualistic vision there too, but it becomes perhaps especially clear in some of his prose writings. In his treatise called Risalat al-Qusariya, Al-Shushtari talks about three categories of people. There is theologians, those Ash'ari theologians who reach knowledge of God through rational proof and argumentation. Secondly, there is Sufis, who reach knowledge of God through direct experience and see that everything comes from God. And lastly, the highest form in some way, are the verifiers, the muhaqiqun, who reach the highest station, seeing reality for what it truly is, which is the oneness of God. The scholar Yusuf Kasawit writes, quote, while the Sufi sees the created realm as a dim shadow or a silhouette, the realizer experiences a complete absorption in direct and unitive knowledge of God and the separative realm of other than God is extinguished. The realizer is not a monist in the sense of believing that God and creation form an ontological unitary whole with one underlying ultimate substance. Rather, the realizer verifies the bold assertion that creation does not exist at all. It is not a separate entity from God. The realizer affirms a non-dualist truth and denies the very existence of the Sufis' empty tense of material creation. God is not veiled by anything, and the category of other than God is illusory and non-existent. And, quote, The realizer is both the perceived and the perceiver, the subject and object of awareness. He is unaware of his awareness and is no longer aware of himself since his awareness is none other than God's. We shouldn't see this as some exclusionary idea though. The borders between these categories are not very rigid and they are not exclusive from each other. So, for example, Ashushtari, who definitely saw himself as a realizer or a verifier, he also probably saw himself as a Sufi to some degree. And in terms of theology, he followed the Ash'ari school of theology. So in some sense, he belongs to all of these categories. But what he's doing here is rather uh, describing a kind of uh, 
um, well, a different levels of realization in a sense. So he isn't saying that the other groups, the theologians and the Sufis, are wrong in any way. It's, it's different levels of understanding reality, of understanding God, with the verifiers or realizers at the top who can see reality for what it truly is. All these different levels of understanding have their place for certain groups of people, but that the verifiers or realizers are those who reach the pinnacle of mystical insight. In reality, there is only God. All else is a kind of illusion. The world of other than God is a report, a khabar, a story we are told and tell ourselves, which we give names and attributes, but its self-existence is an illusion, and there is really only God. These names and attributes, the so-called reports, are there so that they can help us reach the realization of God. But once we reach God's essence, his that, or rather, once we realize God's essence that is always there, we no longer need these names and reports. Shushteri says, quote, Therefore, the one who recognizes God by following the authority of the Asharis is a common believer. The one who recognizes him by theological proofs and seeks proofs of the Creator from things is an Ashari. Moreover, the one who seeks proofs for things by their Creator is a Sufi. And the one who recognizes God through God and sees none alongside God but God and considers things to be non-existent is a realizer. Again, we are dealing with a radical doctrine of oneness, which is why it is called Wahdat al-Mutlaqa, absolute unity. At the same time, though, he is careful to neglect any claim that he follows some sort of incarnationism. There aren't two different things or essences, God and the world, that are unified. There is only God, and to claim that anything else exists or is an agent is akin to polytheism or shirk, the greatest sin in Islam. Quote, Thus, there is nothing with God except God in each thing, nor is any part his. This is the true way of understanding the Islamic religion and its scriptures, according to Shushtari. And they trace this mystical knowledge to many of their predecessors. Very interestingly, in his poem called the Nuniya, the poem rhyming in the letter Nun, Shushtari lists all of his spiritual predecessors, including Ibn Sabain, Ibn Arabi, Ibn al farid Ibn Rushd, Ibn Masarra, Halaj, Nifari, and even extends it beyond the Islamic world to figures like Plato and Hermes. In other words, Shushtari sees himself as representing a long-standing mystical-slash-philosophical tradition which encompasses all of these different masters. But few of them, of course, would express themselves in such radically monistic ways as Shushtari, as for example when he says, quote, For the realizers, there is no arrival at God, since arrival implies an in-betweenness prior to arrival. Yet God is closer than arrival, separation, union, difference, proximity, farness, mental or spatial difference, all of which are attributes of bodies. As Shushtari remained a traveling faqir, a poor man, for basically all of his life. He traveled all around North Africa and Al-Andalus and eventually, much like others of his kin, made his way to the east. Towards the end of his life, as Shushtari basically settled in Cairo, Egypt, but continued to travel, including to Mecca several times where his master Ibn Sabain lived. Indeed, Shushtari led the group of Ibn Sabain's followers in Egypt and here became a very famous and renowned poet and Sufi master. His last years are a bit of a question mark. It seems that his followers preferred him to his more difficult master Ibn Sabain and that they started to refer to themselves as the Shushtariya rather than the Sabiniya, almost like a Sufi order centered around him. The biographies say that his followers numbered at over 400 people, which is pretty respectable indeed. Interestingly though, it does seem relatively certain that Shushtari and his followers joined the Shadili order at some point at the end of his life. Perhaps they had met that order's founder, Abul Hassan al-Shadili, and his disciples when they visited Egypt. This seems to be confirmed in Shushtari's own poetry, where he writes, quote, My masters, they are Shadili. In loving them, my heart finds its pleasure. I agree with the scholar Yusuf Kasiwit here, though, that this does not mean that Shushtari abandoned Ibn Sabain or his, his teachings, as some later chroniclers seem to believe. Uh, this is probably a way to distance the rather well-liked and popular Shushtari from his sometimes very controversial master Ibn Sabain. It seems likely that Shushtari remained devoted to his master Ibn Sabain and his teachings for the rest of his life, even though his, uh, his followers 
and, and his sort of order were, was eventually sort of absorbed into the larger Shadali order, which became one of the largest Sufi orders in the world and still is to this day. Abul Hassan al-Shushtari passed away in the year 1269 in Egypt and was first buried in Damietta, but was later moved to Cairo, where his grave still stands today. He became remembered as an accomplished and beloved, albeit somewhat controversial, Sufi master who held ideas of radical monism which made some other scholars pretty nervous. But regardless of how interesting the man himself is, and he truly is very interesting, he is after all primarily remembered and famous as a magnificent poet. And it is in the realm of Arabic poetry and Arabic Sufi poetry in particular that he left his biggest mark. Being highly educated in Al-Andalus, Shushtari had a mastery of the classical forms of Arabic poetry and wrote many poems in these classical forms. Genres like the Qasida or mono rhyme, perhaps the most widely used and popular of Sufi poetry in Arabic, as well as the Ghazal, the quatrains, and many other forms. But it isn't necessarily these poems that he became most famous for, or which are the most significant historically. Instead, Ashushtari was one of the first to adopt local Andalusian dialects and poetic forms into his Sufi verse. So for those of you who don't know, Arabic is often divided into classical Arabic, sometimes called al-fusha, and dialectical Arabic. In the Arab world, which is obviously very large, the language itself is spoken in a huge amount of different local dialects and variants to the degree that a person from Iraq often has a hard time understanding someone in Morocco, even though they both supposedly speak Arabic. And this has been the case historically too. Classical Arabic, or Fusha, serves as a kind of official standard Arabic. This is the Arabic used in the Qur'an, based on the Qur'an, and used in official context. Many Arabic speakers learn Fusha in school and have varying degrees of understanding of it, but no one really uses it as an everyday language. The Sufi poetry of the Middle Ages was written almost exclusively in Classical Arabic, as it was seen as the proper way to express religious sentiment. Other languages, like Persian, had become more accepted as a secondary language for poetry, whereas Arabic was, at least according to some, supposed to be kept in a sort of sophisticated classical form when it came to poetry. Most of the famous poets like Ibn al-Farid and Ibn Arabi all wrote their poetry in classical Arabic, almost exclusively. But by the later Middle Ages, this norm was starting to be challenged by some. In Al-Andalus, there had started to appear new forms of poetry that broke with the classical metrical forms. A new genre called Mawasha appeared and quickly became very popular. It had a much more complex strophic form than the classical monorhyme, for example, which could lead to more creativity. Mawasha was for the most part still written in classical language, however, but this cannot be said about another new genre of poetry called the Zajal, a kind of popular song in dialectical language. Ashushtari was maybe the first, or at least certainly one of the first, to adopt both the Mawasha and Zajal forms into his Sufi poetry and songs. There is a huge level of experimentation in his verse, often combining different forms in the same poem. So, for example, he composed some Mawashah poems that were primarily in classical Arabic, but suddenly used vernacular language for the, the refrain only, for example. So Shushtari's poetry is endlessly fascinating and very playful, which is one of the joys of, of reading it. Especially in his religious songs, the Zajal, the language and imagery is often very simple, playful, and yet incredibly profound. This stands in contrast to his more classical poems, which often include references to more abstract theosophical ideas and language. So his zajal, his, his, four, his songs, um, are often a lot more simple and, and direct in their expression, which is the, sort of resulted in the fact that they became very popular among the masses, whereas the more classical forms of poetry required sometimes a certain level of understanding and education and knowledge of Sufi metaphysics perhaps and, and poetic metaphors and so on to even understand what he's saying. That's not necessarily the case for his Zajal songs, for instance, which are a lot more uh, clear uh, and, and simpler, right? But still, as I said, incredibly profound. But there's a reason for all this, not all of which are simply linguistic. As we saw, Ashushtari throughout his life remained dedicated to extreme voluntary poverty and asceticism as an essential form of Sufi practice. 
To him, it was the only way to properly fight and conquer your nafs, or ego, your yourself, which is ultimately an illusion. Quote, I clothe my body in cords and needles, bits of discarded wool, I beg a bit of bread. We mentioned the concept of tajrid, which means to strip away, and this is a recurring theme in his writings too. This means to strip away all superficial attachments and identities to the world in order to reach intimacy with God. In one poem he says, quote, فَمَا فِي الْغِنِّ وَاحِدٌ مِثْلُكُمْ وَفِي الْفَقْرِ لَا أَسْبَتُ مِثْلَنَا رَيْنَكَ فِي كُلُّ أَمْرٍ بَدَا وَلَيْسَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ لَنَا There is no one in richness like you, and in poverty there are none like us. We see you manifest in everything. Nothing is ours. Shushtari's extreme asceticism is relatively unusual for the Sufis, as many of them still held it as an ideal to remain in society and start a family, for example. Shushtari, however, would remain traveling around as a faqir, a poor man, for the rest of his life. He often had a very hostile attitude towards any kind of powerful people, especially kings or sultans or the Islamic jurists who would bow to them. In fact, in one of his poems he writes, quote, Whoever bows before a vizier or sultan, he is the arrogant one. Yes, he is confused. His garment suits him, for it is imprinted with covetousness. As an extension of this, he was also significantly dedicated to and concerned with the poor and the lower classes of society, and obviously he also voluntarily belonged to that class of society. To Shushtari, poor people were in a superior state to those who weren't, whether or not that poverty is voluntary or not. Quote, The poor man is outstanding whether he renounced the world by choice or by necessity. This dedication to the lower classes of society is key to understanding the purpose of his songs and poems, why he wrote them in the vernacular language, and his whole way of practicing Sufism. It is said that Shushtari would frequently, either on instruction by his master Ibn Sabain or not, wander around the local souks or marketplaces, what the scholar Lourdes Maria Alvarez calls the medieval equivalent of the red light district. He would go to these souks dressed in rags and sing his mystical songs, perhaps accompanied by companions and musical instruments. By many, this would be seen as scandalous, as these environments were associated with taverns, prostitutes, and the, quote, illiterate masses of men. Clearly, this was both a spiritual practice for Shushtari, but also a strong message to the jurists, the sultans, the conformist Sufis and educated elite who looked with despise on this world of the marketplace. Shushtari, instead, despised their hypocrisy, their greediness and the abandonment of poverty by many Sufis. And this can be said to characterize Shushtari's entire life and his entire message in a way. Both in actions, like here, and in his poetry itself, he always takes the side of the uneducated, of the poor, the everyday person, and strongly criticizes the rule-obsessed hypocritical jurists or fuqaha, the greedy sultans and the elite ulema. It thus becomes clear why he was so adamant to compose his religious songs and poetry in a dialectical language. His audience was the people of the marketplace. His audience was the poor. His audience were those who didn't have the education of classical Arabic poetry or the abstract metaphysical language and metaphors that were often used therein. Instead, he composed light-hearted songs with a strong emphasis on emotion, but that still carried the mystical religious message that he considered to be the true expression of the Islamic faith. Quote, Shushtari's mysticism was, of course, a celebration of the divine, but it was no less a multiform dissent, a protest against the hypocrisy and spiritual emptiness of the Islam practiced and promoted by the fuqaha and the ulema in the service of temporal rulers, and against those who appointed themselves judges of the piety of others. Poetry and song thus were far more than a means of personal mystical expression. They were a tool for recruiting Sufi adepts to a movement whose call for ecstatic religious renewal deeply threatened the power of the jurists and imams. Indeed, jurists at the time and since them have been very skeptical and critical of Shushtari and Sufis like him. They were, to some degree, afraid that they, these 
Strange Sufi figures were attracting the masses and thus compromising their own authority, which of course in a lot of cases they actually were. And as we've seen, this was kind of exactly what Shustari wanted. His poetry and songs had become very important for spreading this kind of Sufi message to, to the general masses, attracting people through his light-hearted songs and beautiful melodies. But the jurists and later critics were not only skeptical of Shushtari because he was very attractive and that he, to some degree, undermined their authority, they were also very much concerned with the philosophical and metaphysical mystical doctrines and ideas that he was expressing in that poetry. Those ideas associated, for example, with his master Ibn Sabain. Now, we should be careful not to view this situation in the commonly misunderstood way that there is some kind of clear dichotomy between Sufis on the one hand and orthodox Muslims on the other. This is a very common misunderstanding that needs to be nuanced. For most of history, these scholars, ulama, and Islamic jurists were also Sufis. There didn't exist this clear line between Sufis and orthodox Muslims. This is mostly a modern construction. The two categories go together most of the time, and Shushtari's critiques of the fuqaha, or the jurist, should not be read as a condemnation of all jurists or of jurisprudence at large. Instead, Shushtari is critical of a certain kind of Muslim scholar. The rigid jurist who is only concerned with outer ritual and who critique others for not following their narrow understanding of the law. To Shushtari, they follow a shallow form of Islam, emptied of all inner meaning and spiritual content, which is what Shushtari is criticizing. This should be kept in mind as we go forward so that we don't fall into simplistic and inaccurate dichotomizing. In any case, his connection with his master Ibn Sabain and his doctrine of absolute unity or Wahdat al-Mutlaqa is the source of most attacks on the poet. And it wasn't always so much the philosophy itself that was the problem, but the very fact that he was spreading these complex esoteric ideas to the masses who had no education in theology or philosophy. In this way, many saw him as even more dangerous than his master Ibn Sabain, as the latter only appealed to the elite through his abstract philosophical text, whereas Shushtari, of course, were very attractive, was very attracted to the masses because he talked to them through very simple songs and, and beautiful poetry. As Shushtari expresses the ideas associated with Wahdat al-Mutlaqa and Tahqiq in many of his poems and songs. It's characterized by a view where God is the only reality, which can be experienced everywhere at all times. In his poems, he often breaks the barrier between creator and creation, between the one and the many, where God is and where he isn't. God is all there is, and all else is illusion and vanity. Quote, Ibshu ism habbaka qultu huwa, ism al ma yakhtalat, what is your beloved's name? I said, him. There is no confusing the name of the Beloved. Just understand me, just understand me. My Beloved encompasses all existence. He is visible in white and black and in Christian and Jew. And in the letters and their points, just understand me, just understand me. In the plants and in the minerals, in black and in white, in the pen and the ink. His poems are frequently concerned with witnessing God everywhere and with the process of stripping bare one's self-identity until one's ego or nafs, any sense of separate self whatsoever, is completely annihilated and only the reality of God remains. This annihilation is known in Sufi terms as fana, the complete annihilation of the self and a union with God, or rather, a realization of the fact that God was one's true essence all along, at least according to the philosophy of Shushtari. In many of his poems, similar to other Sufis, he uses metaphors from common secular poetry and gives them new spiritual meanings. One of the most common of these metaphors is to express the experience of self-annihilation, or fana, through wine and intoxication, 
as in the following poem, quote, نَشْرَبْ بِكَاسِ الْحُمِيَّةِ وَمِنِّي نَقْبَ الْإِلِيَّةِ وَالْلِيَّةِ نَعْشَقْ بِنِيَّةِ I drink wine from the goblet, and from myself I come closer to myself. In myself, it is myself I love. Notice here how he plays with the pronoun for I to completely collapse the distinction between the seeker and the sought, between the lover and the beloved, as a full expression of divine unity and oneness. A similar creative tendency can be found in this poem. Quote, أنت هو القائل والمستمع ما غبا أشتدري متى حضر الله هو الواحد بلا أخر ما ثم شيء مثلي واحد أنا والأين في حقي هو المنا فإن تركت الأين وجدنا It is you who speak and you who listen just when do you think what is absent will appear? God is the one with no other. There is nothing like me. I am one. And the very notion of place in truth is trouble. When you let go of awareness, you will find us. Again, he's very playfully here using different pronouns to express the ineffable experience of unitive consciousness, where one realizes the oneness of being. In this state of being, you, I, and even us are all used seemingly to designate the same reality. At other times, he's even more explicit in his language. Quote, For he is my essence, my true soul. I seek in myself what I already have. I am everything, the center of totality. Accept this. Or, quote, Creation is your creation, and all affairs are your affairs. For what am I, not even ruins? I speak the truth, there is nothing in the universe that is not you. I seek refuge in God from my knowledge and acts. You show yourself to yourself in yourself. Continuity which bespeaks the enigma of eternity. Or even still, quote, Indeed, I am quite aside for whomever might see me. I am the lover and the beloved, there is nothing else. O seeker, the heart of the matter is cloaked by your eye itself. Return to your essence and proclaim there is nothing outside of you. In these popular songs and poems, these unitive experiences aren't explained using complex metaphysical concepts, but in simple language. Despite its simplicity, it is often, as you can see, very beautiful and profound. The implications of these monistic tendencies and their spread to the uneducated masses scared many of the jurists and ulama, which probably made Shushtari very happy. They not only criticized Shushtari's ideas and his poems, but also some of the practices that he would partake in as part of his Sufi practice. Um, in particular, um, aspects that would be criticized are the, the wearing of the patched cloak, the, the, the cloak of poverty, which some Sufis would wear, as well as the practice of gazing upon beautiful faces as a spiritual practice, and just in general questioning the conformity of the Sufis to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Many of his prose works, such as the Risalat al ilmiya and the Risalat al baghdadiya the Baghdad treatise, are dedicated to defending these Sufi practices from its critics and show that they are completely in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet and Islamic law. In the Baghdad treatise, a Shushtari responds to many of these critiques and in turn attacks the fuqaha. He views the practice of gazing upon beautiful faces as entirely justified and even extends this notion. In a very beautiful section, he explains how praising God is not simply done through speech, but through all of the senses. Quote, Gazing upon the countenance is to gaze upon the countenance or head or hair of a poor man or rich man, or in general upon animals, plants and matter. Listening, sama, is veneration. Speech is veneration, as long as what is said is good. Sensory experience is veneration, all five senses. If one recognizes that God encompasses all of existence, every sensory experience can become an act of veneration or prayer. Every word said, every sight one sees, every piece of music one listens to is an act of prayer and devotion for those who have the eye to see God present everywhere at all times. 
Furthermore, he argues, using hadiths and other sources, that other practices of the Sufis are perfectly in line with the Sunnah, but also extends a general critique against the jurists and their understanding of the Sunnah itself. To Ashurstari, many of the fuqaha or jurists follow a shallow, dead version of Islam, one that is obsessed with rules and where the jurists or scholars often take on the role as judges of other people's piety or behavior. He not only sees this as hypocritical, but foolish and ignorant. In the Baghdad treatise, he very cleverly points out, quote, For every member of the community claims that he is correctly practicing sunnah and that others are duped by innovation. Thus, a shirstari can be said to represent a relative doctrinal openness in this sense, uh, never neglecting the sunnah of the prophet or Islamic law, those are still very important to him, of course, and to this practice, but instead a stronger emphasis on personal experience, right? the inner personal experience and uh, intimacy and relationship with God in that sense, as well as the spread of those ideas to the masses, rather than focusing and getting bogged down in formalities and the hypocritical ideas of the worldly, sort of greedy uh, jurists and scholars. Abul Hassan al-Shushtari is certainly a champion of the general population. A Sufi poet of the people, whose ecstatic expressions of the oneness of reality reaches us to this day with its haunting beauty and distinct social message. He used songs and music in Sufi contexts often called sama, not just as a personal or internal Sufi practice, but as a way to extend its reach to as many people as possible. Quote, Ana haynu jayatu qasid wa samiyatu al-ghina wa raja dhalli azan when I went towards my object and listened to the music, my misery became glory and my poverty riches. This and his use of local forms of song and poetry in the Muwashah and Zajal forms, and of course the vernacular language that he used, was kind of a revolution at the time that strongly affected Sufism in the region and abroad. The popularity of these forms of poetry and songs in Sufi Sama sessions in North Africa to this day can to a significant degree be attributed to Shushtari's influence. Indeed, the practice of Sama, or of listening to music as a significant spiritual practice, has been very common in Sufism across history, and Shushtari represents a significant example of that. His poems were often songs, meant to be sung with musical accompaniment, and we saw that he and his followers would indeed perform these songs publicly on occasion. And this connection continued later in history, all the way until today, as his poems are very commonly sung in Sama sessions in the region, especially in the Shadali order to which his followers became basically assimilated. Indeed, the famous 14th century Shadali Sufi Ibn Abad of Ronda writes that he loves Shushtari's poems and that they elicit very strong emotions in him, quote, especially if they are accompanied by music and beautiful voices, which indicates that this was a common trend even shortly after Shushtari himself lived. He isn't a figure that is too well known in the larger world, but he has become somewhat of a local hero in Western North Africa, in countries like Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. His songs are still sung today at Sufi gatherings. They are played on the radio and recorded as music albums. Certainly then, Shushtari's mission of spreading his message through popular forms is still very much working today. And I think this ideal is finally expressed in one of his poems. Quote, Appearances are a delusion, rise to the fore. The signs are in you. To come near the king, diminish yourself. My sweetest moments are when I am one with my essence. Apply your intellect to what is rational. The proof leads you to the proven. You will see the bearer is what is born. To say this is a mistake would be a mistake. Music allows me to speak to the people. My sweetest moments are when I am one with my essence. I'll see you next time.